course, it's a great privilege to welcome Michael Madsen tonight. Uh, he doesn't need any introduction, but I will nonetheless indulge in some introductory words. Uh, I mean, you've surely come across the, the, the work of, of Michael, who has who built a huge reputation on, for his insights on the sociology of, of international courts, uh, which, he, which is a topic he knows very well, which he researches very extensively. He's the director of, of I-Courts, which is a center of excellence and certainly a model for us. Uh, a center of, of excellence at the University of, of Copenhagen, where he also is a, a professor of, of law, uh, managing a, a very dynamic team. And I, and I would certainly invite you to follow the, the, the working papers of, of, of our courts. There, there are actually quite a few jewels there. I have myself been downloading quite a few of them. Uh, so, so that's certainly a, a, a great center which we definitely want to collaborate with. It's a pleasure to, 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 to have you here. Uh, I mean, I want to say many things about, about all your achievements. You're a very, very prolific writer. Your list of publications is, is actually quite, quite impressive. Uh, uh, and you've been writing also on general issues of public international human rights law, uh, European law. You've been visiting professor at almost all universities in, in Europe. Uh, but, but maybe now it's, it's your time to, to visit Manchester. We're very, very happy to have you. Uh, you'll be speaking about a recent paper you have uh, you've, you've, you've published, I think. At least it's available online, and it was circulated, and I hope you, you guys had a chance to, to take a look at it. It's, it's a reflection triggered by this uh, Brighton Declaration adopted by the members, the, the state parties, to the Council of Europe on the future of the European Court of, of Human Rights, and I'm sure you will be sharing some very thought provocative and critical thoughts with us. Tonight you'll be speaking for 30, 30, 40 minutes, and, and maybe more if you get carried away. We have, a, we have a bit of time constraint in the sense that we want to keep some time for discussion, but very, very happy to have you here, Michael. Thank you so much for traveling to Manchester. Thank you very much, and thank you for showing up this evening. So uh, I will take my starting point in that papers have circulated, but I'll also go a little bit beyond it in the sense I'll go a little bit further back in time and I'll go a little bit further into the future. The Brighton Declaration, as you know, was adopted in Brighton in the United Kingdom. And uh, as we speak, actually today, there is negotiations in Strasbourg for a new declaration known as the Copenhagen Declaration. And there is a linkage between the two in the sense that the past way set out in the Interlaken process which includes the uh, Brussels, Izmir, and Brighton declarations, and now potentially also the Copenhagen Declaration. It's already a, a controversial issue if you follow EGL talk. You will have noticed that today I have a blog post there about precisely the Copenhagen Declaration, and there's quite a bit of debate about, about it right now, but that is, of course, because it has been negotiated as we speak. So I will, I will come into some of that uh, uh, towards the very end. But otherwise, I'm basically focused on three conjunctures in the evolution of the, of the court and the system at large over the past 25 years. First, a little bit about the, the post-Cold War era and how the new court came about. And uh, then I will look into when the first um, sort of enlargement happened and, and the first trouble the system got into. And then finally come to what's going on right now, the Brighton Declaration leading towards the uh, current changes. So, um, in 1989, sort of my starting point today, the European Human Rights Court was in some ways experiencing its finest hour. It was argued, sort of almost collectively in Europe, that human rights has trumped whatever they were up against, fascism, communism, and, it, and, and the triumph of the liberal project in the West was very much linked to human rights. It's also in 89 that in a very famous case from the court is delivered called Surin versus United Kingdom. And it's one about extradition to the US or the prohibition of extradition because of the death row phenomenon in, in the US, which made for a sort of a collective sense of Europeanness as opposed to Americanness. So in that sense, the court enters this new era post-Cold War on a very high note. And of course, some have argued it has gone downhill ever since. I wouldn't go that far. But it is clear that it, it enters the new era at its absolute peak. And uh, in the 90s, 
very different from the European Union. The Council of Europe adopts this idea that it should seek to integrate all Eastern European countries in a way as rapidly as possible. And they do that with only a very simple commitment. They have to sign up for the convention and respect the decisions of the court. So it's conditional. It's different than that sense from the original member states. It was not conditional because the Council of Europe pre-existed the European Convention. But what you see is that it's a massive change in the system in very few years, and that we have this influx of new member states, which reaches rapidly within 12 years, 47 member states, going from this old Western clock. And also this means that you have to, to invest in human and material resources, and if, uh, if we look here, you have a, a true picture of institution building. It is uh, the palace in Strasbourg being built. And of course, the irony is, as some have told me, originally it was supposed to be a bit taller here. There was even some kind of, sort of striving for justice up in the air. It has to be cut in the budget because you have to enlarge the other way to have space for more and more judges because there was new member states joining all the time. <coughs> so you get this new court. And this new court opens in 98 with the protocol number 11, which makes a fundamental transformation to the European human rights system. And that fundamental uh, transformation is, of course, that you close down the commission, the filtering system, and every state is now a matter before the court. It also means that the court is compulsory, there's no playing games anymore. So if you're a member, you also accept the court. But there is a fundamental difference in the whole rationality of the system the moment you don't have a filtering commission and a commission also representing litigation on behalf of individuals. Individuals appear themselves before the court. So you have a judicialization. But there's also a deeper dilemma or paradox even in the system at this point because the way it enters the new Europe is of course a set on a high note. And it's a court that has throughout the 1980s in a way developed some of the most sophisticated human rights law at that point seen in, in legal history. So it's a court that has made a name for being hugely sophisticated, very incrementally developing its jurisprudence, and doing so in very few judgments, actually. Bring to that situation the, the influx of member states with serious, in some cases, systematic, endemic human rights problems. So you immediately see that it's a bit of a problem between the sort of sophisticated way of judging in a very particular issues to suddenly have to face what essentially is a process of democratization. So that is sort of the beginning of the new era. So judicialization on one hand side, and then a new set of issues being brought into the system. Another thing that has a huge impact at this point is that while you judicialize at the international level, at the domestic level, you are embedding the system. So you are, as you did in the United Kingdom with the Human Rights Act, you're incorporating the convention into domestic legal orders. And this has actually more impact than most people are aware of in the sense that before the incorporation, it was rare in most jurisdictions that individuals had to claim the convention rights directly before domestic institutions. But suddenly, even in faraway places like my home country, people would actually claim the European human rights directly before the local courts. This, as you see, is two processes that, in a way, go in different directions. It's fundamental judicialization on the international level and in this very deep embedment that means that human rights goes from being something a little bit far away, a great idea, great support, to be an everyday occurrence in, in all kinds of legal institutions, ranging from courts to various bureaucratic agencies. It also means that the court is suddenly receiving a lot more cases. And when I say a lot more cases, it's a, seriously a fundamental change. If we look at just the number of judgments delivered, you realize that in 1990 it delivered 30 judgments. And 30 judgments by the standards of Strasbourg was a very high number in 1990. If you look back in the 80s, you know, you would have a few judgments per year. Going to the first decade of the court, it only delivered 10 judgments for the first decade. So delivering 30 judgments was seen as a big deal. And ironically, you might say today, the preparation for protocol number 11 was a little bit in light of this. There were too many cases. So then you see the steady increase throughout the 90s. It is minimal for, for contemporary standards. It's mainly due to the fact that protocol number 11, the new court, has not taken effect yet. And then suddenly you start seeing this hike in the number of judgments delivered. 
you might think it's going down. The only reason these total numbers are going down is that the applications are being joined by the courts. So the reality is delivering more close to 2,500 uh, judgments on application at this point. So very dramatic change in the role, and also one that has, in a way, sociological implications, because if the original institution was this sort of somewhat sophisticated professor, right, as a matter of fact, most judges were professors, that came together occasionally, it was an ad hoc court, exercising something that looked for most people a bit like a constitutional court, to suddenly becoming the apex court of something in the order of 830 million Europeans for 47 countries, ranging from York in Ireland to somewhere on the other side of China in Vladivostok. It is plain that this is a different institution we talk about. The problem is sometimes, though, that in our own literature, we treat it as though it's the same. But looking at these numbers, you will realize there's a fundamental change of Europe. Here we have the number of applications. It's another way of benchmarking this fundamental change. Again, now we will look at since 2000, that's when the new court takes effect. And you see this steady increase in applications pending before such war until it starts going down at this point. 2012 is precisely when Brighton, the Brighton Declaration was adopted. It looks better for some, but it should still be underlined, this is an enormous amount of pending cases for any international court. I'm not aware of any other international court that has that many cases in the back. So more cases, more judgments, and also more non-compliance if we use the Committee of Ministers reports as an indicator. The Committee of Ministers is the body in charge of executing the judgments, and they list what has happened to the judgments, and as you can sort of find, find a sort of a parallel development in terms of non-compliance with the number of cases and judgment coming out of the system. All of this is of course troubling in some ways, at the same time it's also been seen as, in a way, the celebration of the European success, that it actually is capable of delivering that many judgments and in a way still survive its own endeavor. The interesting thing is also, now if we do a little bit of the sociology of the phenomenon, you see that how the institution in itself on the inside changes. And uh, I'll just bring you some very simple network analysis of the inside of the court to show you how the institution itself changes with these changes. Remember, the original court is an ad hoc court meeting occasionally, meeting that, ju meeting that judges can have other occupations, meanwhile, having that job in Strasbourg. Becoming a permanent court means that you have to relocate to Strasbourg. It's a full-time professional job. This has implications for the institution, and of an order that I'm not sure that the, that the, 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 the draftsmen and women of the, the protocol were aware of at the time. So what I've done is, I have taken the court as a social space. I have coded all judges occurring within each decade. I give them a score in the three main categories of occupation that they appear in, which for international courts always is academia, is sort of diplo diplomacy, policy expertise, and then legal practice. But different from all other studies on the market, I don't give them single identities, because you'll realize when you study a bit more in-depth these institutions, that what marks most international judges is the fact that multiple speci specialization and qualifications. And in each of these categories, they give them a score, meaning that if you're in politics, you've been a minister in the government, you get a score of three. Similarly, if you're at the highest academic level, you get three, and if you're the lowest, you get one. And what you get is something that looks like this. I'll explain. You have the three axes, and then you have the position of each individual vis-a-vis -vis these three dimensions. Of course, some of them score in more dimensions. Some will score, you know, two, one, three, and then there will be players up there or there. The interesting thing is how the institution changes with the, the institutional changes, but also in terms of agency. So we have, at this point from 89 to 99, still somewhat of a, a gravity towards this part of it. Originally, there was far more over here in the diplomatic interaction. And if we go forward in time, we realize that the court transforms fundamentally in terms of agency throughout the 2000s. 
There are more reasons for that. I already mentioned, you know, the fact that it becomes a professional court also means there's a different set of persons who are interested in the job. Another thing is, of course, the Eastern Enlargement, that having political expertise coming from Eastern Europe at that point in time typically involved the wrong kind of political expertise, the wrong color of the political expertise. It also meant that you sent increasingly younger judges to Strasbourg. Yeah. The original bench in Strasbourg had an average age when they appointed of 65. It's a very significant drop, and part of that is, of course, that you get all these judges coming from the East, but not only there, because if we look generally, the sizes of the dots are significantly smaller than just a decade earlier. And then try to compare that to 79 to 89, and you have a very different institution in terms of its agency. Originally, it was a bit of sort of an elite of professors with, with more specialization than just being professors being exposed to various elements of international politics and legal practice. And suddenly, you have something that is much more routinized, and more, more specialized in human rights, not this sort of generalist court sitting there fiddling with their judgments and so on. So what I'm trying to say is that, that the institution is changing legally, institutionally, as we will teach our students, but it's also changing on the inside. And this has implications that we'll come back to, because the fact that this is centered also means that it is equally centered vis-a-vis -vis politics, academia, and practice. The current court is far more oriented towards legal practice and academia, meaning that you get the, typically the specialized academics and judges with many years of experience, because the assumption is that we have so many cases, we need the real professionals to take care of it now. So it becomes a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy in that regard. Of course, the irony is, of course, you could argue it's a good thing that a court gets more judges. It seems obvious, it increases its legal capabilities. But the problem is just that it overlooks that this is not just your ordinary high court. This is an international court, situated in a diplomatic space and with the necessity of being capable of responding to those diplomatic and political, even geopolitical constraints under which it's operating. It's also, whether there's any causality or not, I'm not going to claim that, but it's also at the moment in which that the court starts looking very different, that it gets into trouble. And it starts roughly 10 years ago, first in, with regard to Russia, which sooner or later realized that its military adventures to neighboring countries went to court in Strasbourg, and later on with regard to this country, the United Kingdom, as well as other European countries. Russia is interesting, I think, for the overall picture of this, because it exemplifies the problem with structural the human rights violations, which are also visible in a host of other new member states. And I have to say that Russia is not exceptional in that regard. If you look at some simple numbers about how many cases Russia had compared to Ukraine or, or Poland, you would not find that Russia is faring any worse than those countries. As a matter of fact, it fares quite a bit better than Ukraine in Strasbourg. So there you see this increase, the bottom line that you have all these new kinds of cases coming to Strasbourg. And the problem is linked to the other slide about compliance that even though we have rulings on these issues, since you don't have them solved, what happens actually when you get a decision from Strasbourg is that it spurs more mobilization towards the court. So that rather than solving these problems, it actually creates sort of a spiraling effect of more human rights mobilization towards Strasbourg, which is visible in the sheer number of cases being brought to Strasbourg. But while Russia is an example of a of general phenomenon of structural human rights problems, it is also an exceptional case. The fact that the country has been involved in all these uh, violent conflicts over territory with the neighboring countries is unprecedented in the history of the European Human Rights Court. You had earlier interstate cases in Strasbourg concerning Cyprus, Greece, Northern Ireland, Turkey, and so on, but none of these involved interstate warfare. The Russo Gordian War in 2008, and then later on with the Chechen War and Ukraine, 
are unique in the history of the European Human Rights Court in the sense that it's never seen before that you had interstate war between the member states. Part of the reason for that is, of course, that this was a club of the Cold War. There was a Cold like-minded countries that set up the system. But suddenly you have this, and the system was not at all set up with that in mind, and it's actually becoming a big point of contention in the current negotiations as well. And we can see that it has been capable of overcoming democratization issues, first in Portugal and Spain and Greece, and, but it has never been able to really promote democracy in warlike situations. And part of the effect of this was that Russia got a bit fed up with the court. The cases were piling up, they still are, from these conflicts. And they started having this very heavy and critical discourse vis-a-vis uh, -vis Strasbourg. The Russian critique, you can say, ultimately fell flat because it was so different and it was so easy to explain the root problem. But it was quite a different matter when the British government came out of the bush and started criticizing in the aftermath of very high profile, uh, high profile cases, but starting portraying judges directly and indirectly as undemocratic aristocrats, out of touch with national realities, and even as threat to democracy. And this triggered a whole different set of reactions and emotions across Europe. An interesting thing, again, from a more broad perspective, is that the British critique was not contained to Britain. Actually, you can follow its diffusion to other parts of Europe. And I'll give you one example. This is a poster from a Danish election campaign <laughs> with a Photoshop moustache and yellow stars. They don't even know the colors of the ropes, but who cares? And it says, who decides in Denmark is from the Danish People's Party for an EU election. And, and, and this kind of hostility started spreading like, in, in more and more countries in Europe. It's not to say that it became across the board of political parties, it's not the case, but you just see a growing dissatisfaction and a whole new discourse. The British case, to me, is kind of surprising in many ways, because the moment you get the biggest opposition for Britain vis-a-vis Strasbourg is, in a way, ironically enough, the moment in which the convention has been most implemented and incorporated, not only in English law and UK law, but also in British society to some extent, due to the very big campaigns at the time by Tony Blair and New Labour in terms of this so-called human rights culture. But of course, the changing point was the war on terror and cases related to that, plus some highly technical cases, which normally would never make the news, such as Winters and Noirs and, and notably Hearst. And both of those were technical in the sense that if we go back in history, in the British engagement of war, you'll find multiple cases of this nature and after a little bit of critique, always have been solved. As we know now, it's very easy to solve the compliance with Hearst, as they have just done. People can vote when they are leave, and that's it. <laughs> and, uh, so, so, but, but it was technical cases that were actually not considered of an explosive nature in Strasbourg and the Ruger. But they became that, and uh, this intense media coverage of the court and particularly this idea that it was overruling legitimate democratic political decisions, as in the case of Hearst, combined with that doctrine of parliamentary su supremacy that you also find in a few other countries, such as my own, this created this talk of war between the institution and the member states that to this day is ongoing and essentially is a part of both the Brighton Declaration and the, the current debate over the Copenhagen Declaration. And of course we know that this critique culminated in 2012 at the Intergovernmental Meeting in Brighton to reform the system. And the interesting thing about Brighton is that it is actually the first time in the history of the court that the system is being criticized from a political perspective. If you look at every single additional protocol to the system, and you can do the math, there are 14 until Brighton, actually 15, 14 bits as well, every single one of those conventions have either expanded the capital of rights or streamlined the procedures for exercising the role of the court. It is only with Brighton that you have a kind of pushback 
and a, an open question about what is the political future of this system, considering the kind of rulings and the mass of rulings that it's delivering. And the critique, though, of the court, and I, I don't need to show this in this country, but uh, the bashing of Strasbourg came to heights that is interesting for historical purposes, because it is a little bit unprecedented to start criticizing judicial institution to that degree. These are British ones I could find from other countries as well, although the Brits do stand out in this regard. And I think the, the mere fact that this kind of critical Strasbourg journalism got its own name known as Strasbourg bashing tells a whole story about what Derrida would call the emergence of a genre. You know, so there is something bigger at stake here. And uh, the interesting point for me is not so much what, what happened in Britain, but it's more the idea of the deconstruction of judicial power. In most European countries, in in recent modern times, the judiciary has been the institution you wouldn't really directly criticize. It's kind of part of the democratic deal that you leave that alone to do its job. Of course, we have a, the famous aftermath, the Brexit in this country. <clears throat> and the interesting thing again, without claiming any direct causality, is that this attack on the judiciary just happens to occur in numerous European countries at the same moment, Poland, Hungary, Turkey, and so on. So there's a general attack on, on, the, on the judiciary, or at least there's a very de de legitimizing discourse that has made it, in a way, more difficult to fight back from the judiciary using its normal means, which is to do its job as an adjudicator. This, uh, the Brighton Declaration has to be seen in this light. Because otherwise, I don't think it makes much sense when you read it if you don't understand the context in which it was drafted. And I think it will also be impossible to understand that you could get 47 member states to actually agree on the document. That was, in, in an unprecedented way, highly critical of the court. So what is it it is doing to, to Europe? It's not necessarily amputating the hammer of the judge, but it is setting a new balance in the European landscape. And it is the closest you will get to a roadmap for the future of the European Convention system. And as I said earlier, it is also within that framework you can see the, the current Copenhagen Declaration. So what it does, it seeks to induce a change in the balance between European and national institutions in the protection of human rights. The declaration is, in a way, surprisingly messy, or maybe it's unsurprising when 47 cooks have to cook the meal, but it, it's a, it points in more directions, sometimes it actually gives more power to the court, although clearly the intention was the opposite. But the outcome is a different Europe of European human rights, at least that's the intended outcome. And the declaration has then been uh, clarified in two additional protocols, protocol number 15 and 16, and the interesting thing is, of course, that uh, they have not taken effect yet. And even more paradoxical is the fact that protocol number 16 might never take effect because there have not been enough member states signing up for it after the Big Bang negotiating it. But so is politics, new people, new times. But the fact that you have it, you have this very clear signal from the member states, but you have the legal document still being a little limbo, being essentially soft law, still raises a question that's very interesting for, for our purposes, to see whether such a declaration by its mere signaling effect can actually have impact on an international court. And uh, so what I did, and this will come to the paper, was of course to assess whether we can trace Brighton in the case law of the European court. And uh, the easiest way to see that, if it's a new rebalancing, more power to the national level, was to look into the doctrine of the Martin appreciation and see if there was more of that in the member states, in, and if that was the case in which subject areas of law that would occur, and of course, most controversially, whether some countries came out ahead in the new uh, approach to, uh, to uh, subsidiarity. So uh, what we did was we took the entire data set of cases from Strasbourg, and trust me, there's a lot of them, but we limited ourselves, though, to three years before Brighton and three years after Brighton. 
to see whether there are any ob ob observable changes in the case law. So what you get is something like this. As a matter of fact, the number of judgments in the period is going down. It is both the result of cases being joined, but probably also the result of the insistence in the Brighton Declaration that the court should play a more focused role, that is, deliver fewer, but more important judgments. But the, the occurrence of margin appreciation in its various forms in the, in the case law is actually stable over time. That means, with very simple mathematics, there's an increase in relative terms because there are less judgments of the same amounts. So what we can see is there is actually an increase in margin appreciation following Bryson. But bear in mind, it's an increase that's already ongoing before Brighton. And uh, I haven't done the exact calculation, but it appears like, at least since Interlaken, there's a push in that direction. And probably the change in margin appreciation and subsidiarity more generally in Strasbourg occurs roughly around 2003. So, next question is, is it just a general phenomenon or is it in some specific areas of law that you find this increased subsidiarity? So we then combine the cases with margin and then identify with subject areas of law that you will find this kind of uh, evolution. And interestingly enough, you find it predominantly with regard to Article 3, 8, and 35. Most of the key areas of law, there's no real change. Article 8 is of particular interest in this regard because some of the biggest controversies over the court in Britain and particularly the western and northwestern part of Europe has been cited over Article 8 because it concerns expulsion of foreign criminals. And uh, it is of course very interesting to see that you have a statistically significant increase, it's not huge, but it's still significant precisely in that area. The one that remains to be explored, I'm working on a paper on this, but it's getting a little bit more complicated than I saw, is of course this phenomenal change with regard to Article 35, which is of course the access point to the court. So what seems to be happening is that that margin has entered increasingly into the evaluation of whether people have exhausted in a correct way domestic remedies. It seems odd at first glance, but it, it comes from a new doctrine apparently coming out of Strasbourg that if you have not really argued your case in Strasbourg terms, your case will not be accepted. So in a way, the preliminary work has to be done domestically before it goes to Strasbourg. This seems odd because the history of the way you engage with Strasbourg was as an international phenomenon. So you basically argue your case in domestic terms, and then if it went to Strasbourg, you would then add on the European Convention. But the court is increasingly demanding from litigants at the domestic court to argue it in Strasbourg terms. This is part of a, a more general change in terms of a new doctrine of subsidiarity. But the point is pretty clear that when you have change are in either this access state, which is usually contra uh, contra uh, consequential obviously, and then here and to some extent in Article 3. We leave that out for now. So where do we find it? Well, if you look at the percentage of margin cases vis-a-vis -vis countries, the first thing that is apparent to the blind eye is that it's an enormous difference among the member states. Of course, anyone who studied European human rights law, for that matter, inter-American human rights law, as we discussed earlier today, will know that there are cases where subsidiarity is not really a matter. Torture is not a place where you get much margin. And there are many other areas where it's a bit more the facts of the case will not allow for margin. And certain countries obviously bring that sort of cases more than others. The interesting thing is so that we can identify, if you look at this over time, you only get after 2012 here, but if you look at it over time, you'll find some countries that have more margin cases than others. And one of those countries is the United Kingdom, another one is Austria, you have Croatia, and Hungary. All of these four have roughly the same amount of cases involving margin every year. Which allows us to do something else. It allows us to then check for, so if they have the same amount of cases involving margin, do they also come out equally successfully? 
Or is there a difference between these kind of countries in this regard? What you get is that the two Western countries of Austria and the United Kingdom, they come out ahead more than twice as well as the Eastern European countries. This is of course not completely conclusive in the sense that there is a potentially a huge selection bias in this. You can say that cases from Britain or, or from Austria are more likely to be of a nature where you can argue and win marginal appreciation claims as a possibility. Another explanation can also be that simply the litigants coming from those countries are more aware of changes in jurisprudence as war in the sense that they, they really argue in those terms. And certainly, and I would argue this is probably the most likely explanation, that the judiciaries in those countries are more aware of this. And they argue their judgments in such terms that Strasbourg is likely to accept them. This is what has been called the proceduralization of, of the subsidiarity doctrine by one sitting judge, Robert Spano. And uh, even though I, I'm not personally in favor of the idea, it might well explain some of these outcomes. Another thing we can test for here is, of course, say that does it matter that you are highly critical of the court? Do you come out ahead if you're highly critical? And interestingly enough, there's been a study of, uh, of the, the reception and perception of European Convention in, in a number of European countries, including these, and, uh, and, and, and two of them are highly critical. There will be Britain and uh, Hungary, and two of them are moderately or sparse criticism, that will be Croatia and Austria. But as you see from this, at least, there's no difference according to that line, which leaves you with the distinction essentially between the new and the old. And this is a trademark, potentially, of the new uh, jurisprudence come out of Strasbourg, following Brighton because of the way they have operationalized the doctrine of subsidiarity as meaning that if it can be argued in the right terms, they are less likely to step in. If they can, in other words, demonstrate good faith application of the case law to side. This is a hugely controversial issue, and it's, it's splitting the court essentially at the moment, and uh, it will be very interesting to see what will happen in that regard. If we go a little bit further and look into the very current things going on at the court, we we'll realize that, uh, that the court is implementing subsidiarity in ways, I think, that were not foreseen even at Brighton. It has, by the Article 35 I mentioned before, it is very strict on this admissibility. And if you look at this amount of cases decided here in the past year, it is very striking. And of course, it has to do with the failed coup d'etat in Turkey, where the cases arriving at the doorstep of Strasbourg are being returned to centre because they allegedly have failed to exhaust domestic remedies. And they have that because they allegedly have some kind of institution that can take care of the complaints from former judges that they were dispelled from the judiciary. Some would argue that it's a perverse form of uh, subsidiarity that has been triggered by these changes. Another one that, it, that leads to these very dramatic changes here is a case called Burmich. You've heard about that. But it's basically a case, it's a case that follows a pilot judgment. And it basically joins, I think it's 12,000 applications and returns them to the Committee of minister, Ministers for execution rather than adjudication. Basically, the court says, we have said again and again, including in the pilot judgment, that judgment should be enforced in Ukraine. It hasn't been done. We can't execute as a committee of ministers. Here you go, 12,000 cases in one row. These are interesting developments, and I said, highly unforeseen. And it's a part of the, the game right now, so board figure out whether some of these approaches are, in fact, you know, something that will continue, or it was just a few random the shots they made. Another issue in Strasbourg is still this number. Although it went down from 160,000 to 60,000, 
This is a very, very high number of pending cases. And the truth is, the way it came down was, of course, as you can guess, by picking low-hanging fruit. So all the bigger fruits are still hanging there. And that means that well-founded cases, but not of a top category of priority, are there in the thousands. In principle, all those cases will have to be dealt with individually if you follow the setup of institution, which means it will take decades to solve the backlog of cases. So there's a huge problem there, and it's, it's one that, as I said, that's all being addressed right now. If we look at the system's sort of capability and how that has increased in recent years, it is a, quite a, amazing what's going on. Here you have the judgments, the case load, and what I call the case throughput. And the case throughput is based on this formula. It's basically a similar guess. Decided applications on for an inadmissible or struck out the list divided by the application allocated for judicial information. And if you look at that, and you remember your mathematics from high school, if you have a throughput of 100%, well, then you will you know, deliver as many adjustments as you receive cases. But considering the backlog you have, and if you want to reduce that within the time limit set up by the court itself in some ways, you will have to have a throughput about roughly 130%. And that, of course, has only been achieved in those years where you picked all the low-hanging fruit. It is, in other words, not very likely be achieved again unless the Burmese approaches of sending it to the Committee of Ministers or sending all the cases back to the to the centre are used again and again. So there you have a real issue and uh, it is right now unclear where that's going because uh, what is in the Copenhagen Declaration in this regard is basing it, leaving it to the court to decide because it's considered at the political level undue interference with an independent judicial institution to tell it how to deal with these cases. So what you will see if the Burmese and the Turkish cases are representative of anything is probably some kind of pooling of cases. That's the most likely outcome. If you look at the age of the cases last war, and uh, you've probably never seen this before, because it's never been released before. If you look at the very top, I know you can see it. What you notice is that it's Georgia, Turkey, Azerbaijan, Armenia, then Finland, but it's because they only have one case, Russia, Moldova, and so on. These cases have an average age, age of eight years in the case of Georgia which considering the rules for when it's undue delay and justice denied by delay of justice under Strasbourg doctrine is, is way too long, to put it mildly. It is clear, when you look at this, and if you disaggregate as I have done, that these cases stem from interstate conflict. And then if you look at it a little bit differently, you can almost identify when you have interstate conflicts, Georgia, and so on. And there is a significant problem here that you have cases, and there was even one that was 16 years old. I've been informed by the registrar after this slide has been solved now, it should be removed. So something came out of this work, one case. Uh, but it, the truth of the system is, and it's sort of the not the very convenient truths we're talking about here, is that when you have interstate conflict, you get a pile of, of individual applications awaiting the resolution of the interstate cases, basically. And one of the proposals in the current Copenhagen Declaration is that you should consider whether a system of individual applications in the context of warlike situations is the most appropriate for certain justice. This is hugely controversial. There's already been several blogs about this, and the NGOs particularly is against it because they, they, they argue that they would disappear from the system. It should be said that that should not be the idea, but rather to consider parallel mechanisms for solving that. Because currently, what's happening is basically they're piling up, and they, I don't see when they are going to be solved. Another issue is, of course, this that I talked about before, about capacity of the system. 
the capacity of the Strasbourg system before Brighton was something in the order of 28,700 applications per year. Everything included. After Brighton, the capacity is 70,645 applications. Of course, if my PhD students could increase their capabilities like that, with one signal, I'd be very happy. But it does raise a question with regard to this court, whether that is really what an international APEX court should be doing. Because dealing with 70,000 applications per year obviously requires a lot of resources, not just from the 300 support staff, but certainly also from the 47 judges, who inevitably will spend a lot of time dealing with inadmissible cases, basically striking them off the list. So the capability or capacity of the system has been very considerably increased, but as argued, it has been done so mainly by low-hanging fruit, was dismissal of a significant number of cases after Brighton in the immediate uh, period is the Burmis case, and then it's of course the stricter admissibility. There's still a lot of cases, and as I said, most of those are so-called category four cases, meaning that they really merit individual treatment, and uh, the only way out right now for the court regard to those is probably to establish what it calls itself leading cases, Therefore, they can recategorize the category five to something lower and then more or less forget about them because they're so long down the list at that point. Or, and this is also another alternative that has been uh, pursuing, they can try to settle the cases with the member states out of court settlements, which might, as a diplomatic tool, be the most effective as long as we're dealing with structural issues. These numbers about increased capability, of course, says very little about whether this court has become a better court or not. It says very little about whether it's an old Fiat or a shiny Ferrari, or it is actually the opposite that's occurring when you look at this. And uh, my own view of that is that I am not impressed by the high numbers. I see it as a reason for concern, because it is hard to imagine how, with that much demand, you have sufficient time for taking care of that kind of deliberation on very highly controversial issues that requires you know, collective action of judges. And many of the recent reforms have, in a way, tried to introduce elements, including reforms by the court itself, that is tampering with the core role of the court is simply allocating too much of its time and resources to dealing with cases that have very little significance for the bigger picture of human rights in Europe. So you end where you are today, is in a way where the debate started in 1990 with Lucius Wilhaber. Should this court continuously be the appeals court for individual complaints, or should it assume a different, more constitutional role once again? This is on it's unsettled where this will go. There's a huge dispute, and there's always been, between the ones arguing in the line of Philhaber and the ones typically coming more from the academia and the NGO world, arguing for the importance of the individual complaints. There's no simple rational answer to that, but what you can see is though that the Brighton Declaration points in the direction of more constitutional role, and the draft declaration, the declaration equally does so. so Possibly that's the direction it's going to take now. Thank you very much. not only to issues or to the articles, but also to states. Is this general tendency uh, equal for all states? There are some states uh, in particular issues, particular rights that have uh, more of this, and uh, more sensitivity, how it works. So, so, when, so we see the general tendency that yeah. of course, taking all of the states together. Mm -hmm. But if we look at uh, this, 
you realize it's not general among the states. Some states are statistically more active. I don't have the, the, the real numbers here, it's only percentages of the total case load, so it's a little bit, be a little bit careful, you can't compare directly. But clearly, some states have very few margin cases, such as, for instance, Russia. They hardly ever have a margin case. And Ukraine will have very few. So what you'll find is an increased so variance within the space of the membership in these regards. And of course, it's also the critique of this new doctrine is whether it is it's sort of dividing the space of European human rights according to essentially what's the old West and East because of this doctrine. Because the doctrine puts so much emphasis on the procedural means available. And it seems it is more easy, perhaps, for some old Western court to make a good case for it had done in good faith in application of the doctrine. Mm -hmm. So, 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 so it, is, it is very varied, but it's, it's probably a general pattern between East and West. But we should keep in mind with what I said about the, the, the selection bias, that certain cases simply do not invite for much appreciation, and it's not a place where you typically get that. So there is that kind of variance, and it's inevitable. But the question is just whether the new doctrine is ex exacerbating the differences that already existed. And that has been claimed by some scholars here, for instance, by, by Shakali in a forthcoming paper. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how can you, how can you relate uh, these, uh, these uh, figures with the other one? For example, you have this tendency on the Article 35. Yeah. But is, is the Article 35 the one that has a great, that rise more, that increases more with these first states on, or on the list or not? I mean, can you cross relate? The, the last one, like articles and yeah, I, 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 and yeah, we have, we have. I can't, I can't remember the exact source as <laughs> recorded that, but uh, but uh, there is Article Eight cases have been used a lot with regard to expulsion, mm -hmm. and you find most of those in certain parts of Europe, the West, and also East, and and uh, and uh, so so there you will find that correlation. And, um, but I, I can't give the exact number, but, uh, but of course it's, a, it's an interesting question because you can start <coughs> disaggregating what's going on. And of course no one has ever claimed that it was the same kind of human rights cases that arose in Ukraine and in Holland. You know, that's that's uh, obvious. But, but, but the big question is whether the current doctrine is, as I said, exacerbating differences. I have two questions, a specific one and a more general one. The specific one is that um, you were talking about the two different types of court that we could have and how there are people that keep on saying that having as many individual applications as we can is the way the court should go and then you have other people thinking that having a more constitutional element of it would be a better way to go and then looking at the numbers we have now, we have more applications, but the result is that we have so many admissible cases and then we have important cases that are actually not being decided on, which means that right now what we're doing does not serve either of the purposes. Am I wrong? <laughs> and the second, the second more general thing is that every time someone starts discussing about an institution lately, there are three things that always sort of come up. Soft law, a return, a turn to soft law, then you have a lack of trust in the institution, no matter what the institution has been doing. Has it been overproductive? Has it not been productive? No matter what the institution has done, you have this element of lack of trust and how will it correlate with the national legal order and so on and so forth. And then if for the institutions that we think have been doing a lot, we have judicialization or we have an, uh, the United Nations that have been more active in peacekeeping than we expected them to and so on and so forth. There doesn't seem to be any balance, and not only in sort of my existential problem balance, uh, there doesn't seem to be any balance also in academic discourse, because you have this sort of explanation of facts, and then you, you have this huge strand of global governance going on in every single sort of direction, you being a person who's good with numbers. What do you think about that? Don't say I'm good with numbers, I have people who are good with numbers. <laughs> About the first question, about this essential contrast between more constitutional justice and individual justice. The, the fundamental problem here is that 
that this question will be answered differently depending on from where you ask it. If you were living in Turkey right now, you would certainly argue for the importance of individual justice in Strasbourg because you potentially would see it as your only chance for getting justice. If you live in Manchester, you might be happy about the UK Supreme Court's treatment of your rights, assume that it would treat you well, so you, you don't see the same risk of not having it. And basically here you will see a general split, and in, in many countries in Europe, and I think it's important to keep in mind, getting a verdict, a judgment from Strasbourg, can be a game changer. And uh, so if you can't get the individual justice, you might not get justice. Constitutional justice, meaning sort of more broad, interpretive statements, might not help you very much. So that, so that, that, that there's no, you know, as I said, rational solution to this. But it's also a little bit where the numbers come into the picture. Because, as you say yourself, are you then trying to do a little bit everything and then end up with something that doesn't really look that pretty when you open up the black box, as I do? And I think that's the case in some instances. I find it, frankly, unacceptable that can be that old case of sitting in Strasbourg. It's, it's not a way of serving the role of the court and potentially also you know, undermining for an institution of this nature to have that kind of old backlog. And then there is, of course, the hard question, the one that no one really wants to deal with. And it's, of course, what appears from these slides, because it does deal with it. It is, of course, to pick out those cases, the category four cases, as I mentioned. Where are they going if you continue what you're doing right now? And it seems like they go nowhere, because there's nowhere to go, because there are no resources. So unless you either empower it financially in terms of human resources, or you reorient it, or you find some magical huge potential formula such as new leading cases, reclassification, you are you're not going to move on that. So there is a real caseload issue in Strasbourg that we might have heard. And it, it, there are more ways out of it, but it requires action. And potentially it requires a little more action when you see the action in the Copenhagen Declaration where you essentially leave it to the court. But the question is whether the court has not already Expired, you know, exhausted its options of solving itself. Mm -hmm. That would seem very likely. But the other question about uh, the general phenomenon of whatever you call it, global governance institutions, and of course, in, in my field, international law, they say you know, we are all heard about the proliferation of international courts, which is something I experienced in my lifetime when I studied law. There were five of them. We read all the decisions, and now there are. <laughs> I don't know how many, 25 or something, that order of 24 maybe. And there are something the order of 45,000 decisions and no one read it. So that's a massive change. It was a massive change pushed forward by general geopolitical favorable conditions in the 90s of democratization and spread of the law and so on. And, uh, but, but it's also true, as you said, that it's also seemingly, even though there's been this enormous growth, there is also some pushback at the moment. And, uh, and a lot of the stuff that I mentioned here, you know, this sort of discourse, the critical discourse, which is new, is a part of a broader sort of new sovereignist discourse that you find with regard to many global governance institutions. <clears throat> the interesting question is then though, one thing is these political pushbacks, another thing is the overall evolution of a system of this order. And, uh, if you trust people like Jürgen Habermas, or even Niklas Luhmann and so on, I would find it unlikely that you'll have any kind of regression with you. That there might be noise, but the, the what Habermas would call the need for this kind of coordinative, capacity of coordination at the global level is still there, even though if you don't like the institutions. Because of the level of interaction. It doesn't mean that it all remains the same. But we have just conducted a study that come out in 
later this year about resistance to these natural laws. Systematically documenting what is actually going on behind the facade of the buzzword backlash. And, and one thing you realize is that backlash in the strong sense of really challenging the authority of the international laws <coughs> is very, very rare. There's very few international courts that go under because of member state action. We all have heard about the Sada Tribunal in the Southern African Development Organization. And if you know your history well, you also heard about the Central American Court, the first one that went down in 1917. <laughs> but they are actually essentially the, the only ones in the Permanent Court of International Justice. It resurfaced. Around. So generally, if you look at over the past 100 years, there's definitely more of this kind. There have been, you know, moments of crisis in the 1930s, obviously. But there's also been moments of reaffirmation. So what I see right now at least, and in light of the, the demands due to globalization of all kinds of areas, is not necessarily any kind of collapse in this. But it, it doesn't mean that it necessarily it's going to be international courts. It could also be all kinds of governance institutions. That's impossible to answer. <coughs> yeah? I have two, two questions also about um, out of court settlement. First is more general that society, with with uh, with the sociology. Can you can you study it, especially before the, the European Court of Human Rights, especially yet, considering that like we don't know the conditions, the agreements are not published, etc. And and the second question is that specifically in the in the highly contested these conflict cases, mm -hmm. the. There was many times. There were many times recognized by by either by the president or by by some judges that the court does not like interstate cases or cases interstate cases, and desperately hoping for for our for, for political or diplomatic solution. And which is uh, interesting is that in 2010, just before the the ICJ. Uh, had its inadmissibility decision about the uh, Georgia versus the Russia case. This was also repeated by Jean Bocosta. And, and, that, and since then, the, there is no evolution either in the interstate case nor in the individual applications. Whereas for the very similar uh, Ukraine versus Russia individual uh, or interstate case and the 3,000 or more than 3,000 individual application. The, the approach is totally different. There are already in three years, I think, there are uh, three or four, no, already four in a distributed decisions, and individual cases are, are much more, li like seemingly, uh, much more communicated and, and speedily uh, decided. So, uh, is there any sociological uh, explanation for that? So, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. The, about the out of court settlement. And it, of course, it's, a, it, it, obviously this is you know, not something that's happening in the public eye, you know, negotiations of a high political nature. And uh, <coughs> from the point of view of this, <coughs> what is the goal of this? If the goal of setting up a European Convention with an associated court is to further the protection of human rights, then in reality, there's no need for it to go to a court if you will. Protection that's also, you know, the miracle of subsidiarity in its most naive version is, of course, essentially if the national domestic institution did all the work, there would be nothing going to Strasbourg. That's you know, essentially what's fine in Brighton, you find an echo of it in Copenhagen relations. So, of course, if that was true, there would be no problem. So, so in, in principle, it, it is a tool, and it's always existed. And it's, it's perhaps particularly important in, in cases that can be explosive. And the first, you know, settlement is a very famous case. It's the Cyprus case against the United Kingdom. And the fear of the system at that time was, of course, that if, as the first decision coming out of the Commission, would we find Britain in violation of the Convention for its latter-day imperial practice in Cyprus, would not exactly be very conducive for getting Britain to accept the jurisdiction of the court and individual decision. That was a uh, pretty obvious. It's even stated by Roland, who actually was on the other side, not the British side, but you know. So, so there, you know, the, the, the fact that diplomacy is one of the tools available. And of course, we should recall, you know, from 
most international court. Of course, that's part of it. That you can, that you, the, in a way, it's the ultimate resort to adjudicate in these matters. And this, of course, links directly to the interstate cases. That it seems difficult for a human rights court in that regard. The problem is, in a way, there are so many violations when a tank rolls through a village that you know, you almost you know, collect. And the, the court, as you said, you know, has openly, more or less openly, declared this little interest in getting too many of these cases. I think part of it is that they feel inadequate to deal with it. And they perhaps also feel that it belongs somewhere else, such as the ICJ. And, they, and I think that's also, in, in the system, if you look at international courts and peace more generally, of course the assumption is very often, but it's impossible to really prove, is that if you have these kind of systems, regional in particular, you have less likelihood of, of warfare. It's probably true, but it's very, the causation is very problematic, of course. But it is also equally true, if you have warfare between members the systems tend to go down. You find it, you know, in multiple examples uh, throughout the, the past uh, 50 years in East Africa and Central America and so on. So, so the interstate cases are a little bit at the fringe of what a human rights court can do. And it is, it's hugely controversial to say this in light of the debate that's ongoing right now, but aren't there more appropriate mechanisms for dealing with it? Or at least for settling the conflict. Because honestly, I'm not aware of international courts capable of making peace. And that's kind of what's being asked from it, because these are ongoing conflicts. If the conflict is over, there's no big deal, then it's just business as usual. Bring on the cases and we'll deal with them. But when it's an ongoing conflict, then there is a problem. And it seems not the most appropriate form for that. It doesn't mean that the individual claims but many individual claims are coming out of conflicts, not all of course, are of course property cases. And that sounds that to me that you could consider other forms of claims tribunals for that. But as I said these are these are very controversial issues and I, I can get in big trouble with, with a certain professor from Middlesex over this. But but uh, I've said it as someone who has studied practically all international courts. I don't see this kind of institution as particularly effective in that regard. Mm -hmm. You could even go as far as say it requires diplomacy. Mm -hmm. It is not a judicial matter at the end of the day. <laughs> so there are two more. <laughs> <laughs> um, my one is basically about um, the really controversial area of uh, Article 6, particularly because um, Article 6 of the European Convention, uh, fairness. And uh, with this controversial, you know, um, dispute over hearsay, uh, in which you find cases like Holmes Castle, Akawaja, and Tahir, which actually made the court to accept that hearsay is admissible in, with regards to those cases, but the agency remains so controversial. Just wondering whether the Brighton Declaration, because this case is Hans Castle started before the Brighton Declaration and then it ended in 2014. So Brighton happens to have happened in between. So just wondering whether that is a settled matter now in terms of, um, you know, that particular controversial case, because uh, the, the UK is, is notorious. Notorious. I don't know who that is. The court is notorious in terms of uh, the political nature of dealing with extradition and things like that. And it's all, it all comes down to fairness. Uh, the second part of the question is whether fairness in terms of hearsay that the court has accepted and fairness where a person has been removed and is not present, that particular situation of hearsay where the person is not there and can actually be cross-examined can, can balance the fairness in, uh, in, in hearsay and the fairness where the person is removed. That becomes a very technical question, this one. I, I, I have to decline on answer that because I'm, I'm not fully updated on these cases, but generally I would say 
margin appreciation will not matter that much on such a basic foundational question of evidence. That said, there are clear differences within the bigger Europe with regards to this kind of evidence. And the Britain, of course, has a very particular history in this regard. But it, but it, 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 it is of such a basic you know, nature of the legal process that it would not be shipped home. So, Karen, maybe the last question again. Thanks, Mr. Karen. Very interesting. Uh, uh, I had a, just a, a, a look, it's a methodological question and then a point of observation after that. The, the way you approach the, the kind of flow of cases into the court seems to me to presuppose rather counterfactually a kind of static level of judicial capacity within the states from which cases might emanate. Uh, in that over the, the period that you're addressing, you see absolutely dramatic transformation of the judicial systems in the societies that, that you're looking at, I mean, particularly in Russia. I mean, under Yeltsin, really you couldn't go to court. <laughs> but whereas um, now you, you, there's very complex civil procedure codes, administrative litigation codes, there's a fully elaborated system of administrative law, there's a court system that penetrates very deeply into society. Yeah. And these, these institutional parameters must impact informatively yeah. upon the, the patterns of litigation that come out of the different states. I mean, in many instances, there's simply no need to litigate on matters that would have been very widely litigated or, very, or would have been a, would have been a, a very wide, uh, uh, a very wide course for judicial concern or human rights related concern 20 years ago. And I think. This is a sociological, this is an essential institutional sociological phenomenon because mm -hmm. in some societies, I would say governments really actively incentivized the filing of cases to Strasbourg because they saw this as a technique, as an instrument for building their own judicial systems because they didn't really have, even have educated judges. Yeah. So we need to be kind of institutionally realistic about this and I think this needs to come in as a, at least as a variable when we're looking at these plans. And then, I mean, I'd just invite a comment on this. And then secondly, in, in, in terms of the backlash, and I think your analysis of the backlash in your, in your more informal comments just now is very interesting. I mean, I, I think there's a myth of backlash in many ways. In fact, in Britain, the reason why the, 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 the hostility is directed towards judges is because people notice that they exist. So it's not just the it's not the just the critical resonance around judicial functions which has increased its positive resonance as well, and that judges becoming increasingly kind of half semi-celebrity figures, which would have been inconceivable when they were just seen as aging alcoholics in the House of Lords. And of course, in Britain now, the, the, there is no sign of temerity on the part of the High Judiciary. It's just the opposite, and they'll, 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 they'll walk much further down the line of judicial activism than would have been conceivable 20 years ago. I mean, this is just an observation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The, the first point about, you know, the... I mean, now we look mm -hmm. at an international object, and of course, the first methodological problem with doing that is, of course, it is all interdependent with domestic developments. That goes for this international court, but practically all of them, with very few exceptions. And it, it's very much true, and I, I tried to point to some of it in the beginning, that you have some general tendencies. You have on one hand side the, the, the top level judicialization, and you have at the same time a greater embeddedment of the law of that institution. These two processes are very likely to trigger an increase of cases. As a matter of fact, when you look at the increase of cases, those two processes in themselves are likely to produce far more cases than what we see. So in that sense, what you see in Strasbourg, that's of course the thing that you should not say, is obviously the top of the iceberg. If you want to generate 50,000 more cases to Strasbourg, it could be done, I would say, almost fairly easily if you want, if you know the right areas of law, prison conditions, and so on. And we have examples of people doing that, or so lawyer soliciting cases. So, 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 the, so it is the top of the iceberg. Then there's a, there's a bigger question about is there a general judicialization going on? And I think we should be a little bit careful now, taking 47 fairly different countries in the en bloc, 
But there's no doubt that in, 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 the, in the number of the new democracies, there was clearly a push for this, and there was a huge investment in legal systems, particularly after the Vende in the 89. But there is a new Vende going on right now, and with this, a certain pushback to this. I wouldn't call it backlash because I think it overstays, perhaps with some exception in certain Eastern European countries right now. So, so, so there, there has been a change, but in, in, in two-way change. And it, the interesting thing is where this is going because you say that some of the problems occurring right now in some of the new democracies are precisely the problems that the Strasbourg system was set up to rectify. As they said originally in the Travaux Preptoire, that's when the alarm should sound through. That is what's happening in Poland, Hungary, and so on. So, 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 so that, there's a new pattern in it too. And uh, of course, the, the trick in this is that it gets very difficult to deal with international organizations, particularly when they cover more than 800 million people and for seven countries, is to factor that in that change. But if you take a few case studies, I think it will be pretty clear that you have that development. Then about the, the backlash, and the, in a way, your example of the judges entering the front page news, you know, is, is part of the judicialization in a way. You know, it's, in, a, in a way, it's precisely the same uh, process. And, uh, and there is no doubt, and uh, as you know, I wrote a doctor's dissertation many years ago about this precise object. It is that, that particularly the incorporation of the convention made human rights something more of an everyday occurrence and something that was highly profiled, both in the media very early on, but it was also partly because of the way the politicians, if you remember Tony Blair in this country, pushing <coughs> human rights culture, that it became this sort of issue. I remember when the Pinochet case was going on, the, what also became practically celebrity uh, barristers, you know, very different from the rump holes I saw when I was a young man. You know, so, so, so it changed, you know, even uh, certain Hollywood movies included British human rights lawyers, you know. So, so, so there, there is a transformation there. And of course, when you, when you go on the front page, you should be aware there is a risk of being ridiculed, as you also see. And that is unsurprising. But is there a backlash in a country like Britain against judges? I don't think so. There's a different awareness of them. But is there a severe pushback against the judicial function in certain Eastern European countries? Yes, there is. And that's, of course, also what, at the end of the day, is reflected in the, whatever you call, uneven patterns of Martin. That it is that it is increasingly, once again, an uneven set of member states. And that is inevitable that will come out and use proofs if the court is doing its job. Thank you. And, and because we, we still have two minutes, oh. actually, I, I'd like to push you a bit further, <laughs> because I, I think you, you, you're very polite and very reserved, and, and I'd like to, to push you a little bit on more where you stand, because I, I tend to see some kind of, I mean, you're a bit nostalgic of the pre-protocol protocol 11 court. Uh, you, you like the courts made of international lawyers, Fitzmaurice and, and Spielman and, and <laughs> Malticos and, 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 and all these uh, Western white males. Uh, but you like that court. And you seem to be afraid and wary of two processes, which is first the fall of the public international lawyer, which is what we have seen in, in, in the last 20 years, 1998, 2018. And nowadays we have experts, it's the empire of experts rather than the empire of public international lawyers. And questions are not core questions of international law, but questions of admissibility. And, and it really feels that, well, it's an expert court. And, and also, drawing on your statistics, really, algorithms are at the doorstep. It seems that a lot of, uh, with the fall of the public international lawyers, it seems that now we could carry out justice from from York to Vladivostok with algorithm. And, with the f and that's the fall of the public international lawyers, and, and you seem to be to, to be moaning. The second fall is, well, it's, it's, it's the fall of the judge and, and the rise of the registry. And it seems you, I mean, I'm trying to decipher in between the lines. You, you seem to bemoan the rise of the registry uh, and, and regret the time where we, did, we had these wise men having studied public international law in, in Western universities. Now, now we have these administrators. I mean, it's not even judicialization, it's not even bureaucratization, it is secretariatization. And, and somehow, again, if it's all a matter of secretariat, algorithm and the dual step. So it seems that your, your worst nightmare is the justice to algorithm. And if, if this is the case, tell us. 
Well, the, the fall of the international lawyer, I should be very careful how I answer that, it's the Manchester International Law Center, of course. <laughs> One of them said, we've got a future for you, you are a new center. <laughs> there is, from an empirical perspective, when we look at the institution and European Court of Human Rights, there is absolutely no doubt that this has increasingly become an expert field. When you appointed people like, you mentioned Fitzmaurice, you of course did that precisely because they were not experts in human rights. They would probably not have gotten the job as it were, because they would have been a little bit dubious. You wanted this generalist to sit in those institutions. Interesting enough, if you look at all the international judges across the board, all however many, 500 something there has been since the permanent call of international justice, you will find though that predominantly they are men, that's true, some are white, but increasingly more African though, I should underline, and they are with multiple specialization. So in this court, which in reality I would underline is an outlier in the bigger picture, because in hardly any other, maybe the European Court of Justice, it's up there, has this many cases. So this is not the general court, if you took the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, you would have a picture that resembles much more than what you would refer to as the good old days. So the experts have entered Strasbourg. Well, you know, it's, 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 it seems like it would be a, a consequence of its own success with that many cases. I would not recommend even distinguished professor of public international law to be taking care of an average output of 70,000 you know, cases. That is a, truly a job for, for the experts. Of course, there's a certain truth in the algorithmic justice has entered the case. If you will follow the case law closely, you realize that it often says the same as it's due to a certain function on the keyboard called control X, control V, column paste, you know, and, and, and so on. It's prefabricated, of course it is, because it deals essentially with very, very similar cases. There is, though, a function in it, and I think it's it, perhaps at the end of the day, most fundamental function, that is that of being the ultimate arbiter of some of the most difficult questions you can possibly raise, whether we should put a crucifix on the door, we can wear certain forms of headscarves, and so on. That is not something so far, uh, you know, artificial intelligence seems very good at answering. There you need something else, and that's perhaps where the good old-fashioned judge, not the domestic, you know, uh, number cruncher, but the international judge, capable of dealing with cases like that with the reflexivity that it has political and sometimes even geopolitical implications for what comes out of it. That is where that has it. So the registrar is big. In Strasbourg it is very big. In most international courts it is perhaps even more powerful because they are ad hoc and the only ones who are always there are the registrars. So the whole institutional history and memory is kept with the, with the registrars. But at the end of the day, there has to be a stronger balance in this. Because you can turn this court into something that could deal with, you know, even a few thousand more cases per year. But that would require giving up on some of the old virtues of what is essentially justice and particular international justice. Thank you very much.